up, homie? It's it's going good. There's uh, my neighbors like outside chopping down a tree, like turning it into a walking stick, I think, or something. Wow, that's ambitious. <laughs> now, you know, it's just like right here, just here, like this, like hacking. And I look out my window. He's just like got a saw, and he's just like taking this tree that fell down from the snow. Just, just going to town. Got to stay sane somehow. I guess. Yeah. Right. Some funny shit though. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, dude. Uh, I don't know. I, I started doing this kind of like music hang thing. And um, I saw that, that video of you uh, playing that, that solo. And I was like, holy shit, that dude can play the upright. Was it oh, 10? Thanks, man. Oh. Appreciate it. What'd you say? Ken Miller, is that who it was? Yeah, guitar player. He's pretty unknown for someone who's that great. It's funny. I thought a lot of people knew who he was. And then I posted that and I was like, Everyone was like, who's that guy? Who's the guy you transcribed? Yeah. yeah he's, he's uh he's got he's got books. He's got some great lessons online. He's got that whole like guitar TV thing, I think is what it's called. I'm probably Yeah, right. But maybe it's guitar lessons TV or something. I don't know, something something like that. But he has like some sort of subscription thing. Yeah. And, uh yeah, he's he's a monster. Um that electric record is sick are all the the tim miller like squared and cubed and all those those are super cool oh word i haven't checked those out oh, yeah. i could uh i'll put them in the chat i think if you cool. get it. wait so are you hooked up to something how are you coordinating this podcast thing so right now i'm only re releasing it on youtube and facebook and uh cool. haven't really done any like spotify or whatever um, I just feel like that's kind of a pain in the ass because you don't really get that much money. And I have right. a lot of trouble with DistroKid right now. And I'm sure there's another way that I could go about looking up how to get my music on Spotify or whatever, like mm -hmm. having a, a platform to do that with a podcast. Um, I, but dude, yeah, I don't know. I've been having some trouble with it. And they just keep fucking like jabbing me, telling me I'm uh, doing some dumb shit or like I'm not allowed to do... I I don't know it's like it has to do with my credit card and it's like oh, you know, why did you cancel your credit card and now you can't log back into this thing and it's like well you see I lost that credit card and it's no longer like active wow. to me. yeah that sounds really fun I paid oh, taxes yeah. for the first time in my life uh yesterday oh yeah I know that too yeah. sorry yeah <laughs> how, how was that it's really fun did you get any money back yeah, I, I think I got like $600 from the state or something, which is pretty sweet. Cool. Yeah, I need to do that too, man. Yeah. Uh, yet another thing of shit to do. Talk about just yeah. laundry list of shit. It's like, God, I got to do my taxes. I need, a, uh, I need to make an electronic press kit, which has just been on my to-do list for like eons. Uh, but there's this, like guitar company that wants me to make this thing so they can like promote it. And I'm kind of putting that off, uh, this Spotify thing. I'm putting that off. I'm trying to write a guitar book. Oh, nice. I'm putting that off. <laughs> but you know, there's a, uh, there's some cool shit for sure. But yeah, there's so many, so many things to do. I feel like I'm running out of time in the day. I feel like there's somehow more things to do than there were before. And I really, don't actually have anything to do yeah exactly when you don't have anything to do that's when the pressure cooker kind of arrives that's when you feel like you have more things to do because then like everything that you want to do becomes a possibility like when you're in school you're not thinking or when you have a job or whatever you're not thinking about like oh let me release an album or, or let me release an etude book you're just thinking like oh i need to you know I need to go to work today. I need to get my paycheck. I need to go to school today. You're not thinking about all that. But then when you have all the time to formulate these things and create these things, then it like, it weighs on you. You're like, I need to be doing this. And this greater thing comes yeah, well, now it, It's kind of sad. I mean, it's always been like this, but it's like necessarily, it's like, I need to be doing like what's making me money right now, which is totally, uh, you know, I feel like I, I'm very fortunate that the fact that, like, everything I'm putting out, like, people are buying, which is super cool. That's awesome. I don't feel like I have enough things for people to buy, I guess. What um, are you putting out that people are buying? Shirts and music. Nice. 
uh, I started making like coffee mugs and like hats and whatever, just whatever bullshit. Uh, look up Teespring. Teespring, okay. Like this. Uh, and yeah, if you just like go to this website or whatever and they like finance all your shirts and shit and then you just like set your profit margin so people are just buying shirts and it's like wow like, look at this 200 bucks or something you know and like i don't know what are you a designer or do you just design shirts oh, on this side kind of, like, you see these paintings and shit like i painted these but none of them oh, are like, cool. on the the thing uh if you the best example i can think of is just maybe let me send you my thing or something but uh i i make the the designs and stuff for like my music and i've just been kind of putting the the logos and like the the album artwork onto t-shirts and there's some finagling i kind of learned about it like if you could go to like an image resizer and make your you know whatever any picture that you have bigger it makes it look better on the t-shirt because mm, uh, cool. then you can like shrink it down already again which seems kind of silly but for whatever reason it gives you more leeway yeah and um yeah i don't know i mean i i used to just like really just make all that art on the on my on my phone i don't even really have anything like on my computer or anything but yeah oh, you can do whatever like you could just upload a picture or like you know some sort of digital file onto the shirt and then it, if you have it like transparent or if you have it set as a square or like you know what i mean it's pretty oh, wow. um and then yeah i've been recording like a song I don't know, maybe two songs a week uh, since this whole bullshit has happened. And I think I recorded four songs in like almost two weeks or something like that. It's like, that's oh, nice. ridiculous. You know, I can't remember the last time that I've like written and recorded. Uh, yeah, four great. Songs and like under two weeks. And it's just like, that's uh, that's super sick. You know, normally it takes me like, I don't know, three or four months to do that or something. Yeah. And, um. And and again with with the music, it's been a huge return financially. Like, so I'd say like total like this is super embarrassing to say like I probably made like three hundred dollars off of like digital downloads and like people purchasing the music from online, and that was for like two years. Man, and, that's a, uh, oh oh I thought you meant since the quarantine started. That's well, not that, yeah. That's true though. That's oh. that's the other half of where it's like now I've made like two hundred fourteen dollars or something. I was looking at like not that long ago, and it was like damn you know off of like two weeks worth of work in comparison to like four years of bullshit you know that's uh that's a huge difference i think and um it's just cool to kind of go back and be like okay well what are the things that are making me money so far it's the t-shirts and the song so i'm kind of like i'm not making enough as i was you know and the lesson right. just seems kind of hard i don't know how you feel about that but I feel like no one's really looking for lessons right now. No one has any money. Yeah, well, no, exactly. No one has money to uh, spend on lessons. I mean, yeah, I was just reading a post where someone was talking about how, like, you know, all these musicians are posting about how their gigs are canceled. It's like, yeah, I don't that, know. that to me is like one of the most selfish things ever. Because if you look at it, most musicians have places to go. Most musicians yeah. have I haven't even posted about all the gigs that have been canceled for me. I also think that's going to make me depressed. Yeah, totally. And it's like most musicians have a place to go. Like most, most of these people that I'm, I'm seeing posting this, they're all in school. They're all like, you know, or, or they have, you know, their parents' house and wherever that they can go back to. Yeah, they have rent to pay, but a lot of these people won't admit it, but their parents are paying their rent. Like right now, my parents are paying my rent because I can't afford rent in New York City because I'm not working. When I am working, I can pay it. But most people are in this situation. So, yeah, it sucks. We'd all rather be out playing and, like, going to Smalls and, you know, True. drinking or whatever. But at the end of the day, there's so many worse situations for so many people. We should all just be kind of fortunate that we get to be musicians. Yeah, no doubt. You know? I mean... I feel like everyone's kind of just being like, oh, this sucks, blah, blah, blah. But I don't know. I've uh, I found it very productive. Me and too, yeah. There's really, you know, mild things. It's like I, there's, there needs to be so many other things that I work on during this time. But if I can uh, at least, you know, 
come out of all of this. I was looking at least for Colorado. I'm sure New York's pretty similar where it's like they're talking about like phased openings or something like that. Yeah, exactly. Where it's like 25 people or 10 people or something. And then it's like, I don't know, 100 people, then like 250 people, then like into the thousands or something. But like the 250 people work is like 16 weeks deep. And I was like, holy fuck. Like that's, oh my God. Like that's, that's months, dude. Like, mm, yeah. And uh, that's pretty heavy. So hopefully, you know, they're, they move quicker or, you know, or not. They just be really super upfront with it. And it is what it is. And uh, that would be, that'd be super sick. I mean, just to have like four months of like, just do whatever, take care of yourself and try to just get as much done as you can do. Exactly. Yeah. Cause uh, ideally I'd like to look at, look back and be like, well, damn, now I don't have to make a press kit. Now I don't have to do my website. Now I have, exactly. Now exactly. I have like this YouTube thing. Now I have this podcast thing now. And I'm like, probably 20 episodes stocked up on the podcast which is pretty cool so it's like right. every couple of days i just kind of release one and i probably make you know three or four a week or something like that so it's like cool you know so trying to save content on that end so where it's like because before i guess my only content was like shows i don't know what you were doing particularly mm -hmm. just like, yeah same with me yeah you can turn alive <laughs> so, yeah right uh, now I have like nothing to post other than just like these pictures or old gig videos, which like aren't really relevant anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, glory days or something. And I feel like that's kind of silly along with what you're saying before, where it's like, just yes, we play this sick gig. And it's like, well, you're just making everyone sad that they can't go play gigs. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. But uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I, I think it's, I always find it really inspiring to, um, just see people like back to the original thing, seeing people transcribe stuff. I personally don't do that enough. Uh, I like transcribing like in real time, but that's kind of different. Yeah. Like, uh, you know, just flying into a situation and, you know, learning on, on the spot and, you know, stealing people's licks and shit like that. That's fun, but it's different than like sitting down, especially learning something like a Tim Miller solo where it's like so specific and not even on the same instrument and absolutely do you, uh do you ear it or do you write it down yeah i do it all by ear i mean my kind of general view on transcription is like there's really two specific uh avenues of transcription there's on your instrument and off your instrument and they both serve different things so transcribing something off your instrument is really just about technique because it's about advancing your technique and sort of pushing it forward so you can get out of the prison of your instrument like yeah. the the possibility of me actually being able to play Tim Miller lines in real time on a gig on the bass are pretty slim. Yeah. But if I have new technique and new ways of looking at technique, I can get pretty close. And then there's transcription on your instrument, which leads you to like a developed understanding of the history of your instrument and, you know, what you can do with the instrument as opposed to like, emulating a guitar or a saxophone but i do think they have to coexist you know i think it's good to do both because i hear a lot of bass players who transcribe people only off the instrument and then it's like wow that's really great that you can play a john coltrane solo on an upright bass but then when it comes to having to play like paul chambers or having any kind of semblance of real bass playing then they don't have that and then there's bass players who are like experts in the tradition of the instrument but they haven't really gone past their instrument so that's kind of how I look at it. Right on. What's your philosophy on transcribing in general? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> um, it's it's cool. It's good. I appreciate it. I think like I definitely need to spend more time doing it. But and again, kind of the things that are like going back to like what's making me money. What's like that? I do I feel like is like a bucket filler maybe or something even musically. And it's like, you know, what's uh other than just kind of like digging for new information and, you know, getting new vocabulary, which is really important. I don't think that you shouldn't do that, but like yeah. right now that's not really on the list of things that I'm like, damn, there's, you know, all these old recordings or what I need to do my time checking out right now. Uh, but yeah. no doubt I should be. Um, I've been trying to just like listen a lot more, particularly Wayne Krantz. who was like a, a guy that I've gotten really into. Like, oh, he's awesome. Yeah. Have you seen him? like i've seen him live a few times yeah he's amazing that's crazy i like yeah. i just found out about him like a month ago maybe 
maybe 20. Yeah, he plays down at the 55 bar a lot, which is pretty sick. Yeah, dude, he's he's fucking crazy <laughs> in a good way. Uh, I really like that dude's playing, and I feel like I listen to him, and I'm like, damn, that's what I've been trying to do. Like, you know, I don't know if Wayne Cran spends a lot of time, like, transcribing. I For me, like, I love to just, like, sit down and just, like, play some shit just improvise dig deep you know maybe pick some sounds pick some voicings or i don't know maybe a line is in what you could get from transcriptions i guess but uh particularly just like imp- improvising is is super fun especially when you're doing like fusion shit in a trio setting it's just like yes <laughs> but uh yeah. i don't know those are uh it's just like which one do i like more maybe like definitely improv and then it's like I just feel like I, I'm like probably just because I'm not as good at it like I feel like I'm just like not burdened but it's like homework or something where I'm like okay now I need to go back and listen to this measure and I'm not doing this thing and like I don't know I'm just not very disciplined in that aspect I guess yeah I mean that's interesting that you say that because there's so many methods of quote-unquote learning how to improvise that have nothing to do with transcription and then there's all these great musicians like i've heard fred hirsch say he doesn't not only does he not transcribe but he doesn't believe in transcription because that sort of promotes the philosophy that all the great music has already been created which i don't agree with that but i think that's a really valid and interesting way of looking at it yeah yeah i mean it's i don't know i guess something eventually i should spend more time on but i'm just kind of like pretty content with what I'm doing right now I'm not like and I feel like okay in the past when I did spend a lot of time transcribing I was doing it because I was looking to learn how to play specifically like jazz guitar and I was yeah. like okay I'm looking for all these voicings and like how to play this tune and you know whatever I, I don't know just like you know how does Joe Pass play how does Wes Montgomery play how does whoever right. kind of like checking out the players and then like you know going through and kind of like learning tunes I the last like whole record I transcribed was Speak No Evil. Oh, I love that record. And, uh, but again, that's like, there's no guitar on there. And I don't, I don't even, can't even remember the last guitar solo, like start to finish that I transcribed. Yeah. Uh, but I don't know. I, in general, don't really try to sound like I play the guitar. Uh, that's good. I, uh, I think Pat Metheny always said that he wishes that he played the trumpet. And you, like you can kind of hear that in his playing <laughs> to an extent that's cool yeah. it's also it's also cool when people who play not that guitar is an easier instrument but it's one of those instruments where it's really probably easy to sound like a guitarist like that stuff is like same with the saxophone like you can tell when a saxophone is like yeah i just want to be like a shredding saxophonist but then when they can do things that sort of transcend the instrument and you can hear that they have influences off the instrument that to me is really special i always dig yeah. that yeah, dude, I mean, hip saxophone players are, are one thing. I spent probably, like, three or four years playing the sax. And oh, man, that's cool. It was, uh, it was a crazy learning experience. I mean, that, I definitely spent a lot. And that's, I'll say that, too, whenever I pick up a new instrument, that's one of the things I do the most is start transcribing. But I transcribe things I already know. Like, oh, I, that's I interesting. Figure out how to play it on that instrument. Uh, so it's like that's not necessarily the same thing I don't think but yeah I agree and, and it's like I guess like that I maybe haven't played it on the guitar but I've like learned this song or I've heard it a bunch of times and I'm like oh I'd love to learn this alto solo or something right you know? and uh but it's like oh well I've played watermelon man or whatever the fuck you know what I mean like right um, yeah it's been never on this instrument and on this solo or something but I'm like aware of what the changes are already or something so it's kind of yeah. like me learning the sunny sit solo like note for note or something but right uh yeah whenever i do new things like that i always try to like play along i guess uh but that i feel like just is like just getting comfortable i don't know if that's the same thing um i've definitely done that I, I, at some point i should probably learn how to play electric bass because i'm horrible at it you know, but <laughs> what you, you don't play electric bass? I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I take gigs on electric, but it, it's, it's, it's pretty embarrassing. Oh, but yeah. when, I, when I have to practice electric for a gig, what I do is I, I take a lot of the information that I learned on Upright and try to transfer it. And amazingly, it doesn't transfer at all. I mean, really? it's about, to me, it's about as different as 
trumpet and trombone. You could actually say that guitar is closer to electric than upright. It's sure. a totally different thing. Uh, yeah, know? I played upright like when I was younger, like until yeah. I was like 18 years old or something like that. I'm like 26. Oh, cool. So it's been like almost 10 years since I've really played. But uh, I played for a little bit and then I pretty much just played guitar. And when I was like seven, I started playing the electric bass. Mm, my cool. mom like made me start playing in the church band and so that was really kind of like it's a different thing you know it's like it's just here's here's c here's g like it's really easy you know right. yeah it's not like super complicated until uh, then i got older and i started taking like these gospel gigs and i was like playing in black churches and i was just like dude this is so hard like <laughs> you know and uh yeah. it's like those guys are like the best in my opinion those guys are like the best musicians well, on the planet and, you they know, got it all back to that thing where it was like i do there was no charts they just yeah. like send you the tunes and be like here you go and then you get there and then they would play it in an entirely different key than they sent it to you and yeah it's like i'm a lot of times i just didn't even read the music that they sent me or whatever it was because yeah. i was just like it didn't even matter like if i as much time as i spent doing the homework it was like more of an ass kicking than as if i were just more present in the moment for particularly trying to play bass if i was looking for the i needed to know the like a particular voicings i would say if i was playing guitar a little bit more but for bass it was just like okay you were doing this okay we're going up okay okay here's the two whatever you know i was just like more in it i guess consciously that's kind of a weird thing but uh yeah it was it was very strange but i i never i haven't played it like a band gig on an upright and i do feel like i'm pretty successful at playing regular electric bass just like on gigs and most people are like how long you you know you must be a bass player i'm like well i ain't doing it a long time but like i'm not like you know i'm not a wizard but like yeah i mean if you can get through a gig on upright that's that's pretty good dude it's uh <laughs> I just recently started playing the cello over here oh you got a cello nice uh, yeah my girlfriend plays and she's super good and i'm really terrible but uh <laughs> i've funny. i've recently it's very it's much smaller and then the fifth tuning thing is just like mind-blowing uh, yeah it's like oh it's man pretty I, cool i i think red mitchell the bass player had his bass tuned in fifths which is kind of interesting hmm. i didn't know that there were jazz people who did that but apparently he did that i actually started on cello when i was like well, I started on piano, but I was playing cello for a bit when I was like around nine or ten. And then mm. when I was in high school, I really wanted to play jazz. And my parents, who are both musicians, were like, you know, they were more into that than me playing classical music. Because in obviously in jazz, you control your own destiny. In classical music, it's like, mm -hmm. forget it, you know. Yeah. But like... I told them I really wanted a saxophone. So I was like, all right, you know what? That's fine. I don't want to play cello. I don't want to play piano. I just, I just want to play saxophone. I just want to be like, you know, John Coltrane yeah. or Michael Brecker and be able to burn, you know. And I don't they, were like, they were like, you know what? We're not doing that. We're not going to get you a saxophone because you're not going to work if you play saxophone because there's 8 billion saxophone players. They were like, you could, you could throw a quarter into Brooklyn and hit a young tenor player who's really good. Sure. So they sure. bought me an upright bass against my will, and they were like, "This is yours now. This is." Have the you had that thing. same upright bass the entire time? What? Have you had that same upright bass the entire time? Um, I got a different one when I was like seventeen or eighteen, a better one. Okay. But yeah, I still have that instrument. Yeah. Cool. That's sick. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. For for me, I've had like a million guitars. I feel like. Yeah, I mean, guitarists, they, they just collect shit. Every time I go to a guitarist crib, they have, like, nine or ten guitars, and they got a story about each one. It's like, oh, yeah, this one, like, this one I got from whatever. Or like, I don't know. Yeah, I just have... It, it's a cult, for sure. You all have, like, bulletproof cases and shit. It's like... They just break so easily. They're... <laughs> they're so... I just... I don't buy, like, you know, $3,000, $10,000 guitars or anything, but, like... And I, I have in the past, and they still don't last terribly long. It's like, you know, it's kind of more worth it just to buy, like, a $500 cheap guitar and just, like, rip, fix it once or twice and just throw it away, basically, and just get another one. Because, like, you can make that much money on a gig, like, pretty quickly. 
That's true. And, yeah. Uh, it's like, you know, and it's not, it's not really about the instrument, I guess is what I'm trying to say. It's like, if you like get used to it, you know, like sure it'll have some flaws and whatever, but like it, it still has six strings. The notes are the same, you know, it might sound a little bit different and feel, uh, you know, different cosmetically or physically or whatever. Right. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. That's kind of interesting. I feel like uh, I don't know very many people that have like the same instrument. That's yeah. Like, well, that's the thing with upright is every instrument is so different, and it's like then there's like D necks or E flat necks and all these specific things that like it really takes a couple years to get to know an instrument. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Mine never never really lasts that long. I would love to get something. I was seeing like these steel like the resonator guitars, I guess, and. Uh, I was seeing that they're making them like electric with like, you know, like strat telly body styles, like very thin. And I was oh, yeah. like, that's what I need, steel guitar. That motherfucker will never break. <laughs> yeah, right. But uh, again, $3,000. And who, who has money right now? I mean, that's kind of the, of the interesting thing right now. I was talking to uh, this, this New York guitar player. I, his name is Chris Buno. I'm not really sure how to say his last name. B-U-O-N-O. Um, but he's, uh, you know, kind of talking about the de the devaluing of everyone just putting out content for free right now. It's like if you're actually trying to like make people pay for your shit, everyone's like, I don't have any money, and there's kind of disputing that. Of course. But uh, yeah, I don't know. Do you uh, what are your what are your plans for for right now? Are you just gonna hit the shed and just try to fucking dig deep? That's basically what I'm doing. I'm in school now. I'm a graduate student at Juilliard, so I'm wrapping up my first how's, year how's online like switching with that um it, I, I don't think it makes a lot of sense <laughs> because you know obviously you can't play together which is like 90 at least 50 percent of music school yeah. and then the thing about juilliard is it's it's a great positive environment but you don't get that environment if you're you know doing classes in your room you know you you have to go there and, and be inspired and be around everyone yeah so i think generally the way yeah. schools are handled it's really, that's an interesting topic i think everyone's room is really different and like your room is kind of what you make of it honestly like as someone who's lived in like like literally just a really tiny bedroom for like a whole year it's like yeah it it's very possible if you are like maintaining you know your your workspace and everything but like some people have like no space to like maintain and like you're talking about then maybe they're just fucking on the go on their laptop or some shit it's like rough but uh yeah yeah dude i uh my girlfriend is a grad student for cello and i'm watching her do her online stuff and i'm just like S -s so silly like yeah uh, it's it's completely ridiculous the i i took some online cl classes at berkeley like back in man, probably like 2012 i like, went through this whole slew of shit before i decided i actually wanted to go to school for jazz but mm. uh i went to auto engineering school and then i went to community college oh wow and then i went to ut and austin and then i studied with the dude who was the guitar teacher at berkeley bruce saunders mm. and he was super good and then i got into the berkeley thing because of him and then that was like a very different experience from what i've just seen from this where it's like it was like, go read this etude, record yourself playing the etude. And then it was like group guitar Zoom hang thing through Berkeley. I don't know how they had like 30 people in a chat. And then you could like ask questions, but everyone was also plugged in. I don't know how that necessarily worked on the technology thing. But, you know, it'd be like a very like interactive thing or it's like, okay, everyone play like a C major nine chord or something. And then like, kind of like, it wouldn't be like jamming, but it was like much more kind of like in like conversation maybe totally and um yeah i don't know i mean it was it's a very different experience from what i've seen like uh just people doing like i guess my girlfriend's doing like these excerpts or something just kind of recording stuff you know it'd be really cool i guess you know whoever i don't know like your ensembles or something it's like let's all get some recording shit and somebody record to a metronome and let's record these tunes that we were going to play and just do them video you know i mean it would like take some manpower or like some computer technology whatever but i'm sure through some apps and some even just you know okay i'm playing along to this thing and it's like okay whatever it is what it is but it's like at least like you guys are like putting out shit and this is like 
how to collab on the internet one-on-one you know that's like that's like how to make money <laughs> you know and that's like of something course. that i never learned in music school at least for me where it's like go home and learn you know 2062 or confirmation or some shit and see you tomorrow and then it's like okay you know that doesn't help me make money at all of course but, i mean that's generally a really it, it's a i mean i think there is validity in teaching classical music that way because a lot of it is so precise and so technical but yeah. especially yeah it's like obviously the music that came from the streets and came from the clubs to teach it in such such an impersonal way to me that's doing a great disservice and you know one thing i like about juilliard is there's only 50 of us there's only 50 students in the jazz program so our every, relate every instrument or or just uh just, in general, there's 50 of us inclusive of graduate and undergraduate. Hmm. It's a small program. So what, what happens is we get really close with our teachers. So that relationship kind of mimics the relationship of mentorship and, and teaching and learning from your elders that was originally present in music. Yeah. Which I think is great. You know, and like most schools don't have that. Most schools are people who are just upset because they didn't, get as far as they wanted so then they're just angry and they enforce these things and their students that don't help them at all and they it's not that they don't care they care to an extent but it, it, it's not it's not as positive as, yeah. as it should be, you know? i was definitely victim to some of that which is yeah. kind of why i strayed from doing what i originally wanted to do is like some of the teachers i had were just so like mean and like spiteful of like the positions that they were in and it was just like totally. it's not what i want to do like at all because these people just fucking hate what they do and like, exactly i don't want to be that guy but it, it's an entirely different situation but when you're like perceiving it from like the student teacher perspective it's like way different psychologically i think absolutely the irony is i would love one of those gigs you know obviously you know we all we all want to go on tour and we all want to get signed or whatever and, and that may well happen but i'd also just for the sake of security i would i would love a teaching gig yeah. So when people yeah. have a teaching gig and they're like, you know, they're just upset. They're like, oh, you know, look at me. I'm teaching. To me, that's like, that's great. Yeah, yeah. Like, you're, sure. that, that, that is doing it. Yeah, okay, you're not on tour with Chick Korea 11 months out of the year, but you're making yeah. enough to take care of a family all from jazz music. That's, yeah, yeah. that's pretty good, you know? Sure. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, the whole question of success is always on on my mind of like what like I don't know like I've I've gone on tour I have done like the whole like adjunct faculty thing I've done like that's awesome uh, I don't know like I've played like probably like 300 gigs this year or something like sometimes I have like three or four gigs in a day it's so stupid wow. you know and it's like I've been teaching private lessons I've taught it music schools and whatever and you know and it's like okay well what what is like success because none i just sounds like so stupid to say but none of them really feel like that satisfying and like right. and i do them individually i guess but when i do them you know kind of collectively it's much more satisfying uh rather than just kind of putting all my eggs in one basket that's just me but you know especially now i'm like okay well what is success especially during this time i'm like well there's really making money playing music that's like really it right now it's like if you're still managing to do that and whatever you're doing dude you're you fucking beat the system way to go you know that's you've transcended the virus and everything and you just made it happen but exactly um i don't know have you do you have much experience doing the online teaching thing um no actually not at all um this is badass that what we're doing right now so like if you are you on your computer or are you on your phone yeah i am uh if you like scroll down and it says like recording or whatever it might be over yeah. here to you but you could just record the the conversation or in this case like the lesson and like that's pretty unreal at least for someone who's taken like a million lessons where like i never fucking recorded anything and i just was like writing stuff down and i at the time i was horrible at writing down music so it was like <laughs> really a, a, a big disconnect between like what I was actually able to write on the page and like what I was able to play and then how could I write that down and 
you know, other than like, I have a bunch of voice memos on my phone from a long time ago that sound really bad, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you, you can hear especially what they're saying, but not so much what they're playing, but even just the audio explanation. But now it's like, you can see like visually, like here's me and my instrument, and, like playing whatever, and you can talk and it's recording. You can watch it over again. It's like, holy shit. That's pretty uh, revolutionary in terms of like online lessons, I would say. And you can teach people internationally. Um, I would say like, rather than just having this kind of like really small span of like, well, I can only drive like 20 miles for it to be like feasible for me. It's like 40 miles in Colorado is like an hour and a half in the car just cause the mountains and shit. And uh, so I don't really want to do that. I'll drive like an hour max and then you're going to get charged like 60 or $70. Like, I don't want to like, you know, that's still like three or four hours of my time. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, it, right. it's not really worth it for me like commute but when you do the online thing it's like well I feel pretty comfortable charging it like 40 45 dollars because I don't have to move it's just like there's no gas there's no commute time uh you know it's like even when I was working for music schools it was like I people were paying like 40 dollars and I was only getting like 18 or something so you know now it's like there's no middleman blah blah, blah. like there's a lot of perks to it it takes a while to get started, I would say. And the other thing is like, I think doing one day, like to fill your schedule up and then kind of moving around. So you're like, Tuesday is my teaching day or whatever, you know? And uh, it's easier just to kind of like feel like you're doing something and you, you know, imagine times that by five or three or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, plus all the other things we've said, it's like, that's like a pretty decent income. Um, yeah, absolutely. Down to it. But it's it's uh it's kind of marketing and it's it's hard right now. And I don't know, especially for the the upright thing, I feel like you kinda of have like a unique thing going there. Yeah, thanks. I just need to figure out how to market that thing. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I think uh that's that's kinda of everyone's thing. Like for me, I try to be like, oh, like, you know, I was talking about this, like do you wanna learn how to play slide guitar? Do you wanna learn regular like you know acoustic or electric or alternate tunings or I have like a baritone or something it's like trying to find something that's more unique where someone's like actually would need some guidance rather than just like here's how to play like an, an E or whatever it's like here's the half whole diminished scale and all 12 keys on the upright people would be like whoa yeah exactly and, you know I'm working on Kind of like yeah. clickbaity shit. That's that seems like a bad thing to say, but like exactly. Well, that that to me is the problem. Like right now, I'm working on an etude book. It's going to be twelve etudes, all in the upper register. Okay. The amount of shit. First of all, the amount of shit that I'm getting from people for doing this book is unbelievable. I I can't even wait to see, like the river of shit. Are you talking like, like criticism? Yeah. Would I I I don't think that's a bad thing. I don't think that's a bad thing at all. I also agree with that too. Uh, just, yeah. not, you know, sorry to inter interrupt, but oh, I, yeah, I feel yeah. like this PDF thing of like E minor arpeggios and people just roasted it alive. Yeah. You know, like, oh, you know, oh my God. But at the same time, it was like at the top of this group and it had like 50 likes or whatever. So I don't, yeah, exactly. I don't agree with the, the confrontation being necessarily right. a bad thing. If Start you're doing something that inspires any kind of strong reaction, I think you're doing a good job. If someone looks at, at your work and they're like, this is nice or this is okay or whatever, then then that's not, I don't think that's where you want to be. But, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Sorry, I was leaving my cat in. Oh, yeah. It's like if you're doing something and people are angry about it. Like every, every older bass player I've told about this, they just get pissed. They're like, what like why would you do that like you're a base denier like that's what you are you're not a real and i love that because that means that i'm doing something to evoke a strong reaction sure and then but, yeah well yeah. that you just be like dude that's for the other book this is like this was yeah so right crazy. but then it's also like the arrogance like the arrogance you have to have to be like i am good enough at this thing yeah i'm going to sell you mm. how i do it because I'm that good at, I mean, if it's like, you know, Stephen Curry teaching, about it like that. Oh, okay, yeah, well, then everyone should pay for that, but some, like, 24-year-old kid at Juilliard who thinks he's good enough to teach everyone this thing, and that's the thing, yeah. you have to be arrogant in a certain kind of way. I think you do, um, 
I've experimented, I guess, with the arrogantness a little bit, where it's like, I could say that I've played with Grammy people. I could say that I have my master's. I could say that I have worked at a recording studio. I could say that I have taught for over 16 years. I could say, you know, I could say all these fucking stupid things that like really- but If they get you a gig, then they're not stupid. You know? I don't know if they do. It, I've, I've experienced it both ways where it's like, so either either I've like like had like the the maybe the dick measuring contest one where it's like I, these are all the things I've done. This is how cool I am. Blah blah blah. You know. And then I've gone the complete opposite way and been like, here's my name and here's my number and here's my music and here's my availability. Let me know. And normally that one works better. Or I don't give them any whatever kind of cloud or uh ego maybe to whatever and it's just like here's the thing whatever check it out if you like it you don't you know cool i don't really care yeah. maybe or something but like making it seem like you're busy or something like it's just like a short like whatever most people like seem more engaged in that maybe maybe i'm wrong but no that's that's for sure if you're the busier you make it seem i got great advice from from an older musician once who was like when someone calls you for a gig make it seem like you're not sure if you can do it. Just be like, hmm, yeah, I don't know. Let me check. And then get back to them like 20 minutes later and be like, yeah, I think that can work. You know, if you say yes right away, and they're like, oh, what are you, free? Like every night this week, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought that was good. Well, I don't think that's super bad either. Uh, I guess it depends on what you're looking for. If you're like, oh, this guy's a noob or something. But uh, I don't know, like... For me, I would love to know that a bass player has no other gig right now. I would be like, that, "That's oh, interesting." Man. Yeah. Uh, only because I'm in, like, before all this bullshit happened, I was just in this position where I like, I stopped teaching. I was, I was only performing. I wasn't doing anything online. I didn't have any streaming. I was just like only making my money off gigs and through a tip jar, basically. Yeah. <laughs> and it was like, and I, I would hand burn CDs. And I would use my old sheet music from college because I had like binders full of shit I never read anymore. And I was just like, I'm just gonna wrap it up. And maybe some super fan will like be like, here, I learned how to play your Keith Jarrett transcription of all the things you are or something, you know? And it's just like, maybe you will, maybe you won't. Maybe you will look it up on YouTube and be like, wow, this is really cool or something. I don't know, but I thought it made it a little bit more interesting. And uh, so that was like really it as I just had like a stack full of these CDs I would burn all day long. I went to the gig and a tip jar and I would just play my own songs and maybe a few covers but it was a, a very interesting like time I was like you know now looking back I was like damn I was doing like some crazy shit like I was that was my only form of income <laughs> but like yeah right it's crazy that you could you know really rely on something that heavy but um it was like oh well now there's all these other things that happened but I was playing I don't know, three gigs a week, four, five, eight gigs a week or something. And it was like, most of the time, they, these places, because of, because of my recordings, I guess, people wanted, like, when they would hear a band, and it'd be like, oh, like, how much for the band or whatever? And it'd be like, well, blah, 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 blah. And then I would get there, and I would have too many gigs, and I wouldn't be able to have a bass player for this one gig or a drummer for this other gig or so-and-so wouldn't be free for two gigs in a row or something like that. And I was just like, damn you know and like it was like me having to like pull like from this huge pot of people and like just kind of like hiring random guns because it was just really sticky and uh i don't know then eventually i was like well kind of drew the line where i was like this much money gets you just me and then this much money gets you the band and i have now learned that getting a drummer is pretty hard so like i have to plan that more specifically but um you know, it's like if if somebody were to come up and be like drummer or bass player, like yo, I'm free every day, and that would like just be a huge time saver for me. I mean, like honestly, if if you were like even not not that good, that would be more appealing to me than someone who was like god level, uh, and was like, uh, and I I definitely done that before where it's like I I've played with some people before who are like really really good and like, but they're like I charged four hundred dollars or something, and I'm just like that's crazy or like you know maybe maybe i won't leave the door for 300 or something like he very common example and like they're great players but it's like i have this other guy who like totally do it for 50 bucks and you know 
and to me that's like the difference of a lot of things that's a lot of burritos you know and uh especially when the gig only pays like three hundred dollars you know when when you're talking about gigs that only pay three hundred dollars that's crazy because some of the most exclusive gigs in new york city pay like 50 bucks sure 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 and no that's that's a huge thing too it's like that's just a number but i split that three hundred dollars whatever like three four ways it's gone you know it doesn't go very far and it's like okay you're getting paid 75 bucks or something like that you know and and that's the interesting thing about charging a premium like that because you know if joe's if joe farnsworth is going to take a 50 dollar gig then who would i be to say oh i charge a hundred dollars you know like but then it's the other side of the coin is if you know you're going to get away with a hundred dollars or more five i guess more appropriately like five or six hundred dollars if you know that you can get away with that and you need that to make your rent then why not you know so it's interesting to balance that you know it is so i don't know in general it's like well if i had this guy who's really willing to play with me every week and he may not be as good but you know, in the terms of the dollar amount, he's more flexible as to this guy who, like, may be God on the upright base or something, but, like, I can't afford it, so it's, right. and, and that sucks, like, I think there's, like, different things, too, I kind of, like, now realize why you see, like, Wayne Krantz playing with just, like, some random-ass drummer, you know, and it's, like, who's this guy? Never heard of this guy, <laughs> you know, and, like, maybe he's good, I don't know, but, like, you know, it's just, like, kind of random, depending on the situation, and it's, like, oh, well, I understand why now you have like these studio albums of like him with like Tim LaFay or something like that, you know? And it's like, it's like this really like they plan that shit. It's like, he's like, I like this guy and this guy and we're going to go in the fucking studio. But then you're touring and gigging and that's just a different scenario entirely because everyone's schedules are like mashed potatoes all the time. <laughs> yeah. right. It's crazy. Um, yeah. I don't know. Have you, uh, have, are you like, gigging a bunch and stuff like that around new york yeah sure yeah do you are you uh have you tried to do much like i don't know how how is like the the gig situation versus like playing trio or big band or something where do you find like the most work you well know? big band does doesn't really exist anymore for the most part sure. well i guess like when i say big band it'd be like six or ten people or something oh, yeah. oh I, see, I see what you mean yeah yeah um, you know, five five horns or something. Yeah, you're just like crazy. Yeah, but yeah, you know, um, your ensemble maybe or. Yeah, I do a lot of random gigs. To be honest, a lot of the gigs I do are like trio or quartet. Mm-hmm. Singer gigs are definitely good. There's this thing at Juilliard where they send a bunch of musicians out to play corporate gigs. So that's how I make rent every month, which is pretty solid. That's super cool. Yeah. yeah. Mad respect what do you do on the corporate gigs like is it just like like an hour or two of standards and then that's it you know what uh how do you learn standards what's uh, by ear they just pick a recording you like and learn from that recording yeah dude that's kind of like always the sticky situation i feel like uh yeah you, you gotta start somewhere though but um you know, there's so many recordings and so many damn reharms of all these uh, other things, and it's like, who even knows anymore? I think my, my, my belief is to find the earliest recording, because yeah. you can always go to, like, you know, there's always going to be a new modern recording of something that, you know, yeah, someone you know did last. There's always going to be a new hip reharm. You can always find it, you know? Yeah. And some, some of it is great, some of it isn't great, but to really get to the essence of a tune i think you should start with the earliest possible recording no doubt. If, if you find like you know chris potter's for like all the things you are or whatever like chris right. potter's solo yeah. and all the things you are is great like if you want to learn the tune all the things you are that's a great reference point but to really learn the tune i would go to like a coleman hawkins version or something, you know? sure sure yeah more relevant to the release period or something exactly yeah um yeah right on at least at least for me, my given method is, yeah, I guess pick a, a thing, whatever song, and then I just try to learn the whole thing as like a chord melody, but not really. Like you could do this too, where it's just like like bass and melody note, like. And, that's, yeah, that's huge. I do that all the time. Uh, and then uh, the second thing, like once I understand like what the the harmony and the form and the whatever is, 
and like basically I just picture like the lead sheet whatever it would look like in my head which seems kind of silly but uh you know if I can remember like oh it's 12 bars or 32 bars and then this one is this one and whatever and two five here and whatever there's four sections and I don't know something like that I try to just visualize in my mind and then exactly, yeah uh what if I can think about the song freely I guess and then uh, I try to put it on every string like I guess you you would kind of max out on like E and A but right. like if I could play it in any position of like whatever and it's not really being limited to like playing it this particular way I guess because I feel like everything's really like well this is where A is there's like you know four eight different nine different ways to play A uh you know I don't know you know what I mean so totally. it's uh not being limited in that sense and then I don't, I only, I don't do the 12 key thing very hard anymore. I only do like three and I just take a look. Oh, I've, I've never been a 12 key guy. Yeah. I, I, I don't see the point. It's like, okay, so yeah. now you know how to play. I concentrate on you and B, like who cares? Yeah. Yeah. I don't think, it, I don't think that's really what it's about. I think it's just about the sake of learning the Roman numerals. But, um, yeah. There, there's a fair argument for that where like you just kind of like look at it and you're like oh, okay well i don't really care what key it's in you're just looking at the one the two the whatever blah, blah blah and you know and I don't, I don't know that that was always what i thought it was for and then like uh i remember we used to just do dumb shit in the practice room where we would use like i real b and we would just like make it modulate like in minor thirds playing like giant steps at like 200 bpm and just like can we comp can we do whatever can we just pull up <laughs> You know, and it was just like, can can you do that for like thirty minutes, and then? Well, yeah, the can you do that thing? I'm a huge fan of that. I I just released. You should you should check this out. I just released a silly uh, Instagram video of me playing at 500 beats per minute, and I superimposed it with the saxophonist Chad Lefkowitz Brown because he did a 500 beats per minute recording. So I was like, oh, yeah. why don't I play at 500 beats per minute? And then you know, which is like the most a musical nonsense ever i mean everyone who i played it for just said that it gave them a heart attack but, <laughs> but if you can that's my thing if you can do it why not you know like if a weightlifter can lift 300 pounds or whatever yeah. why why not do it it's like it's an impressive thing that most people can't do so if, if you can do it go ahead I, I don't totally hate on it in general. Yeah. Like, it's it's so crazy that, you know, look at this. Like, I, the other day I watched this guy try to explode a milk carton with rubber bands. And I yeah, was like, there you go. This is, and it was for, like, six hours. It took him, like, yeah. like 3,000 rubber bands or some shit. And I was like, why the fuck am I watching this? But, like, I really what? watched it because it was like, there's no way you can do it. You know, but, exactly. like, same thing. It's like, you can't play that shit at 500, my ass. And then you watch it, it like, oh, damn. He did do it. Exactly. <laughs> the problem is when people are only that. There's a lot of people on Instagram who are just like, oh, look at this. I reharmed autumn leaves. And then four bars in, it's just like, where are you? You know, and there's a lot of people who own. So the problem is when your only thing becomes cerebral, your only thing becomes technical or physical. Yeah. I, I do have a problem with that. That was, uh, dude, that, that was my biggest thing. Like, I, and I don't really play jazz very much post college. Mm -hmm. And last I played with people who I know that, like, if Mark Juliana were to call me for a gig or something, I'd be like, okay, <laughs> you know, or, like, I was, this, this month I was supposed to play, like, uh, this place where Schofield just played, and nice. Mark Juliana just played there, and T. Green played there, and, you know, Ben Wendell, and all these motherfuckers have played there, you know, it's, it's called Dazzle, I don't know if you've heard of it. Oh, that. yeah, I know about Dazzle. Sure, yeah, I was supposed to, my group was supposed to play there, and I was like, this is fucking crazy, like, wow, you know, yeah. everyone and their mom I can think of that's a decent jazz musician has played at this place and I was like this is like a thing I can put on my resume and you know I can't believe I got the gig honestly and the dude was like out some random ass gig I was at this like punk bar and I was playing with like totally random people I never played with before but it was under my group and we were playing my tunes and I was just like well, let's just play, play totally free I remember saying that and I was like whatever I don't, I don't know why I said that that day but I just did and it, and then like not only that but the power went off in the middle of the set because the snow was so bad that like this the whole building went out for like three or four minutes and then he came up to me after the set and was like let me buy you a beer that was fucking dope do you want to play at dazzle and i was like i've been emailing you guys for like two years or something and he was like oh 
my bad, you know, or something. I don't know, whatever he said. And I was like, here's my card. Here's my number. Literally the next day he got back to me and was like, I'd love to see you at Dazzle. Do whatever you want, you know, kind of thing. And I was like, I want to have like basically a big band show and uh, just get as, as many people as I can. And uh, I had like written these tunes specifically that I've been releasing, but like kind of for that. And now I'm just doing them at the crib, but different, whatever bullshit. But I was like, dude, that's like some, some crazy, some crazy. Yeah, that is an insane circumstance. And uh, yeah, sure. And I, I don't even know. It is, it is very insane. RIP. I, I haven't heard anything about that, but I hope that that continues to go on. But uh, yeah, that's great. that dude, that dude's cool. He, uh, the guy who's like the booker there, like does some Red Rock shit now. And I'm like, wow, that's, uh, it's pretty crazy. Like the, the scene you know like but those are those are really the only jazz gigs i take like where it's like I, if i'm going to a place to play with standards or like a jazz-esque music where you know maybe it's original or something but you know what i mean like where you can do some crazy shit but otherwise i don't really try to do that otherwise i try to play like one four five like play like i've like written music specifically that's like harmonically really simple uh, that I can play at like bars or just a club or like if I were to go and play at like a brewery or someone's party or a corporate gig or something where it's like unless they really want you to play standards and like that's what you're going to specifically do I don't feel like jazz is uh, a safe bet financially specifically where it's like you get so shit tips and people just don't even care and like when you're like here's I'm gonna play all the things you are unless it's like the best version of all the things you are you ever heard or something but well that's well that's that's exactly the thing i mean that that to me is why jazz as as a music i'm not i'm not talking about every jazz recording ever but that to me is why jazz as a music is so great is because it's about survival and it's because the musicians that are out there playing and out there doing it are literally the best at that thing and you can't really so every time you're hearing live jazz every time you go to dazzle you're not just hearing jazz music. You're hearing the yeah, best. Like, you know, yeah. You're hearing like that's the best. I give a fuck about it. And those are the scenarios that I'll do it, I guess. And yeah. Like, uh, but it's interesting. I didn't. I don't know. Uh, maybe maybe everyone feels differently about that. But uh, it's just like, dude, there's a uh, maybe fake jazz is the term I'm looking for. I mean, that seems kind of silly, but it's like no, I yeah, think I a lot of these people like playing jazz at places where it doesn't belong and it's just like so wrong and e even if even if they're pretty good you know but if they're not like Ari Honig or something like that then it's just like it's just wrong and well that's why I love it it's it and that's why jazz is like it's similar to professional sports in a lot of ways because no kid grows up playing basketball and says oh I I want to play in the G League that's my goal. I just, I just yeah. want to make the G League. I don't want to be drafted to the NBA. Sure. I don't want to play basketball at Kentucky or whatever. I just want to be, be mediocre and then eventually see if I can get to the, the G League. No one says that. Everyone's like, I, I want to play for the Lakers, you know. But in jazz, you know, a lot of people are ignorant to the fact that they have to adopt that mentality. A lot of people are just like, yeah, I just want to do it, whatever. There is no that. You're yeah. either well – yeah. Well said. And you're either nice Brad thing. Meldow or you're just you're, – you're, you know – I would, I would, I guess, like in those particular situations where I'm, where, where people are trying to play fake jazz, and I'm playing jazz, and someone's like, "Let's play all of me" or something, and I'm like, "No, <laughs> like let's play anything else." Just because you know that I play jazz, I like we could literally probably make something better up, like literally right now, that people would like to listen to than us than you trying to play all of me, right, right, right now. Like you're better at playing gravity by john mayer or something or whatever yeah, like right. honestly i would like feel more comfortable doing that with whoever unless i knew that they were like like you like i like if you were to call whatever I, and i knew it i would be like sure let's do it like that, that sounds cool and we could pull it off and it'll be whatever we want but if it's just some kid who could like barely hang on and just in and feel it's the feel it's like oh. it's like you know and it's like let's change something anything about this <laughs> yeah. yeah 
I don't know. Uh, but I, I don't I don't mean to talk shit about it, but it's just kind of something that I learned where it was like a, this really sticky situation, especially in terms of money, where it was like, you're not going to get paid if you try to do some bullshit. Right. And that's probably for anything, though. But like, uh, you know, try to play to other people's strengths in, in the gig situation more or less than like trying to be like, let's play jazz because like we should. And like, I agree. I totally agree. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, you can't take it. All right. I hate to cut this off, but I have a class to get to. Oh, hell yeah, dude. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah Thank fun. you for having me. Really appreciate it. This was fun. Totally. Yeah. Uh, Merry Christmas. I'll catch you later, bro. <laughs> yeah, man. Stay safe. Uh, it was a pleasure. Peace out, bro. Likewise. Peace.